I think that the financial component, that was something that stuck out to me in the book is that mm -hmm. some of the foster parents that, that you were involved with, you know, mm -hmm. they were doing it for pecuniary gain, not just the goodness mm -hmm. of helping, helping people. And I thought that was, you know, yeah. fascinating in a negative and cynical way, but, but talk a little <laughs> bit about that. Yeah. So back then I was in foster care, like, um, the eighties. Um, and so, Back then, it was about fifteen hundred per kid, so you had a lot of a lot of people getting into it just for that. Not saying that um, that's every foster parent, because no, there are really really good um, foster parents out there that do it for the right reasons. But, but, but we're then... we're here to call out the slimy bastards that are doing it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> So let, let's yeah. not, let's not over apologize for stuff that doesn't need apologizing, but like literally, you know, one, one of the situations, like they had multiple foster kids and what you're saying mm -hmm. back in the eighties, when gas was cheaper, you know, you get yep. 1500 per kid coming in. Yep. You can just yeah. sit back on your fat ass and do nothing. Yeah. When gas was 99 cents a gallon <laughs> and yeah, they were getting 1500 a pop and how many I had, there was two sisters, another girl. They had five of us at the time. So oh, if you can do your math, that's, that's 7500 bucks nice. in the 80s, man. Yeah, you're in a 3-2 rancher. What, 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 <laughs> yeah, what, they, what, what was the good Gordon Gecko movie, Greed is Good? <laughs> yeah. So, right? so what, what, what was your overall experience there? I mean. It was, well, I, in my total time in, in foster care, I was, in about I think six or I think I was in seven homes altogether. Why? So they, I, wh why? Yeah, why that many? Why not? Why? Why you can't stay with just one home? <laughs> what, I mean, she couldn't stay with one therapist. So what do we expect? <laughs> Facts. <laughs> we're, we're saying a common denominator here. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's okay. So back then, or or. Let me put it this way. Back then, no one wants a damaged teenager. Everyone wants the, the baby, babies that the are babies. less than five. Right. I wanted to you ask know, you about that because yeah, everybody wants the babies. Yeah. Yeah. So the teenage kids, male and female, they either end up in group homes or, you know, if, if they stay out of the system, they're on the streets or whatever. Most of nine out of ten, they're in group homes so, because no one wants a teenager. So... Um, a lot of the homes when I first started were friends of our family or friends of my siblings that would sort of take me in um, until they're, you know, they realized this is way too much. Like, you know, they can't do it. Then my social worker would have to find um, somewhere else for me to go. So it's sort of like I muddled through the system back and forth to different homes until um, I went off to college. You, you know, there's the one part of the book that like really hit me and it Ryan, was, I'm surprised you read the book. I have to be honest. I'm I'm a reader, <laughs> unlike my mother. She used to be a reader. Um, no, I told you I'd read the book. I didn't spend seventeen dollars American for nothing. <laughs> no, for, for real though. Like, and I, I I know there's the the beginning of the book is a little rough if you're you know mm -hmm. anti molestation, um, mm -hmm. but. What I would say, though, in, in a different way, this hit me is you were in the foster setting and it, there yeah. was there was a discussion where like it was Christmas time and the mm -hmm. foster parents were like literally insistent that none of their own personal funds would mm -hmm. be used to buy Christmas gifts. Yeah. And that just struck yeah. me as like, how petty are you? That, yeah. Yeah. You know, that you feel. I mean, at the end of the day, this person is existing and living in your house mm -hmm. and you don't have enough like empathy i don't even know what it is you don't have enough of an emotional yep. connection to mm -hmm. drop a few dollars on a gift you yep. know and, and and i would assume like you know if you got a gift that comes from somebody that's not not you paula but any of us and, yeah and, and you know they kind of had to go a little extra to do that it means something it to definitely you. does yeah you know right whether if there's right. somebody that doesn't have a lot of money or just somebody whatever right but the fact that they were like almost like just insistent and combative mm -hmm. over this was just like you guys are just shitty human beings that angers me yeah. I, don't know. I'm just, I mean i'm pissed off right now <laughs> <laughs> and bubba don't read yeah you know and it's not even just that we you know they we were bought because they got a stipend for our clothes 
Um, they get their monthly, of course, um, tax, and um, they were covered by medical. So yeah. they literally didn't have to do anything. So Christmas, you figure, would be out of the goodness, of, especially if you're a quote-unquote Christian. Um, you know, you do things out of the goodness of your heart. But no, some of them, it literally is just about the money, and they're, they're not attached which is why they can do the things they do. Yeah. So it, 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 yeah, it's kind of sad. It really is. Uh, t- t- two other quick points I want to address now. In one of the yeah. situations, you, you like the people were ostensibly exceptionally religious and kind of sounded <laughs> yeah. like you had to keep going to church and anything. Uh, now, in my own yeah. personal experience, my mom made me go to church. And mm-hmm. she made me eat vegetables. And the two, th- <laughs> the two things that I don't do in life now as an adult are eat vegetables or go to church. So mm-hmm. did did that experience of almost kind of being mandated to go to church mm-hmm. like ha- give you any sort of like reactive yeah. feelings about religion or church yeah. in, in any way? And what was that? Absolutely. Um, there were two cardinal rules for foster children. Um, and you know, while I was in the system, I, I just, you know, plucked my social worker's brain. I tried to find out as much as I could because, of course, I'm in, it's about me, so I want to know everything that's going on. So one of the things that she, two, two of the things that absolutely cannot happen is a foster parent is not supposed to impose their religion on the foster child. And then you're not also, you're not allowed to, um, Amen to thank that. them or, <laughs> You can't spank them or, um, you know, give them beatings or anything like that. You're not supposed to touch them physically. So those are two absolutely, you're not supposed to do that. And with that home, all of, it, all of that happened. Um, yeah, we were in church, let's see, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Tuesday evening, Thursday evening, Friday evening. Yikes. We were in, yeah. When did you guys get to drink, smoke, and chase whores? <laughs> <laughs> None of that. Oh, None of that. Very so yeah, it sort of made you, you know, but you sort of have to compartmentalize. Like, okay, the other homes I went to, they, you know, it wasn't like that. So it's just this family. So yeah, it sort of left a bad taste in your mouth about religion. But if for me, I had a strong foundation prior to going into foster care. So it sort of didn't turn me away. If any of the questioning I had about my faith, it was why am I in this situation? Period. Gotcha. So you, know, so it's sort of sort of like that. Um, but no, I, it took me a minute to get through um, understanding the faith part and coming to grips with everything. But that particular family didn't shy me away from you know going to church and um, my religion and faith. So it was all good. And then another thing in the situations where you had. Not, mm-hmm. not your, uh, you know, your blood siblings, but when mm-hmm. you, you had foster siblings, mm-hmm. um, do you have any contact or any ongoing relationships with any foster siblings that you were with during that five year span, or is it just mm-hmm. everyone's gone their separate way? There's just no connection. No, everyone has gone their separate ways. Yikes. Um, a couple of the homes, um, it sort of, it sort of went awry. Um. You know, people start to show their true colors when when um, things are not right and you approach them about it. Um, things are sad and then you really understand that they were not in it for the right reason. So because of that, um, because once you're grown up and you're starting to deal with all these things and, you, you know, you're talking to people, you start to learn more of what you didn't know while you were in the midst of it, if that makes sense. But those, but that's more of a standpoint for the adults, right? Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like if you're like, so to speak, for lack, lack of better terms, you're in the trenches with these siblings. Mm-hmm. If you're in a bad yeah. home, uh, yeah. or what have you, it's like you guys are all having similar experiences. It would yeah. seem like you guys would like, you know, potentially bond or, or yeah, or that would create a yeah. relationship. But it did. It, but well, it didn't. one, yeah, no, one home, absolutely not. We were. It it completely we, it was torn apart. We all went our separate ways, and um, I don't talk. I have I don't talk to any of the foster children that I was um, in homes with at all. Uh, the last home, I was I was pivotal in getting the kids, myself and the children, out of that home, and they you know they were no longer allowed to have foster kids because I sort of like explained everything that was going on. 
um, you know, about just us going to church and one of the girls were getting spankings all the time. So I sort of put all that. Were these behavioral the spankings or S&M spankings? You know, well, okay, so she was about eight. I was like seven, 16, 17, and her, she was in foster care because her mom was, was crack addicted. And so <laughs> she was born with crack in her system, so she was fidgety. Okay. Of course, we're in church. How many days did I say? Four days a week. Too damn so many. Just, right. She just couldn't keep still. So they would pop her legs or they would, you know, bring her to the bathroom and spank her there. Or when we were home, you know, she just couldn't keep attention um, like she could. And, I, you know, they literally should not have had a child like that because they weren't capable of handling, you know, her, her situation. So they, you know, they would, they would beat her a lot. And I knew the rules. I knew one, you're not supposed to do that. You guys are, you're already getting away with bringing us to church 500 days a week. So <laughs> I knew that that was not supposed to happen. And so once they found out all of those things, um, they eventually just took us all out of that home and they lost their license. So at, so, at some level, there is some mechanism to discipline mm-hmm. or, or mm-hmm. get these fraudulent parents out of the system. Yeah, it's hard, though, because, you know, it's not you don't have a lot of people that want to be foster parents. So it's hard. They they're desperate. They don't take them out. All right. Unless it's absolutely a necessity or it's dire. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, rough. it's rough. I mean, I guess like in the big picture context, I mean, you mm-hmm. found yourself and, and, and a lot of children, I mean, across the country, globally even, find themselves in, in just completely untenable family situations that they cannot yeah. exist and develop in. <clears throat> right. And then, you know, it's either like the foster system or the children's home. You know, mm-hmm. is there any level or any point where with time and perspective, Mm-hmm. You've been able to look back and say that, you know, although there's a lot of traumatic things, that there was some positives out of this or it could have been worse if I didn't have this. I, I just kind of curious as to how you process such a, an experience. Well, where I'm at now, I understand it could have been worse because I've learned as an adult um, or going into adulthood, you hear stories of other children who've had it worse than I've had it. Um, so when, you know, it's sort of odd for me because when everyone is saying, um, you know, how brave and strong I am to even put this out there or write the book, I just sit and think about all the kids that are in the system that are that had it way worse than I had. 